inductors, and capacitors. Physically very different devices, but fundamentally the same kind of thing. They're for short-term energy storage. They store it in different ways, they behave in different ways, but they store energy and then release it according to how we hook them up. Long-term energy storage would be batteries. You have your chemical batteries. You've got where you pump water up and let it sit there until you let it fall again. There's ways to do long-term storage physically that are stable, but these are unstable. They leak. They're very, very quick, but they don't hold it for long, and they don't hold much compared to a battery. It's not very dense, so that's why short-term. An inductor stores energy in the form of a magnetic field in response to current. A capacitor stores energy in an electric field, charge separation across its dielectric, in response to voltage. There are so many parallels between these two. And before I start talking more about it, I'm going to impress you with just how parallel it is. What is the formula for how much energy is in one of these at a time? How much energy is stored? Energy in joules. For an inductor, the amount of energy in joules stored at any particular moment is one half times the inductance in Henry's times the current squared. This is when the inductor is stable, as in it's not charging up or discharging. This is the current currently going through the inductor at the particular instant that you want to know its energy. For a capacitor, the energy at a particular instant equals one half times the capacitance times the voltage squared, where the voltage is the voltage across the plates, the voltage that the capacitor is charged to. Do you see any sorts of similarities here? Do you see what's going on here? The, the symmetry, the similarity between inductors and capacitors has just floored me at how cool it is, but here it is again. It goes back to electromagnetism and coils in the first place. Essentially, if you want to think about conceptually how it works, think of a capacitor capacitor storing and releasing voltage, and an inductor stores and releases current. Obviously that's a huge hand wave, but we're not trying to learn quantum physics here. The way it works, that's how it works. If you charge up an inductor with a certain current until it's all fat and happy and not changing anymore, and then you just rip that current away, it's going to put out that current, that same current. If you charge up a capacitor to a certain voltage until it's fat and happy and not doing anything and just sitting there charged, and then you rip away the charge and you let it go, it's going to release that voltage. That's what I mean by storing current and voltage. So for example, let's say we have power. We have a capacitor and we have a resistor. Let's say we connect it like this. Let's say this is 5 volts, and let's say we just leave it sit there, and sit there, and sit there, and sit there, as long as we want. This capacitor will then have 5 volts across it. It will charge as much as it possibly can, and then it'll sit there at exactly the same voltage as the power supply. And then, we go over here, and instantaneously switch it to the resistor. The capacitor acts the same as a power supply at 5 volts. It releases discharges across the resistor and back into itself, but in doing so it's depleting the charge on itself and the voltage will go down and down and down and down and down until it reaches zero and the current stops. How much current? It's putting out a certain voltage. It's simply Ohm's law. At any particular moment it's going to have anywhere from 5 volts to 0 volts and then you just have current equals the voltage divided by the resistance of the load and so the initial current is going to be 5 volts divided by the resistance, and that current is going to go down and down and down to zero as the voltage goes down and down and down to zero. The capacitor is the easier one. What if instead of a capacitor, I have an inductor? So let's say I hook it up the same way. Now I've short-circuited my power supply because the if we, if we pretend that there's zero resistance here, there's actually some resistance in the wires and such, but maybe less than an ohm. So effectively no resistance, which means effectively infinite current. So this is going to charge and charge and charge higher and higher current until something explodes. So we need a control. We need another resistor. Let's say this is 100 ohms. So now what do we have? We have, again, current equals voltage divided by resistance. So 5 volts over 100 ohms equals 50 milliamps. So if this inductor were not there, this would be a 50 milliamp flow. But the inductor hasn't charged up yet. The inductor generates a back voltage, an opposing voltage, so initially there's no current at all. But as the 
inductor charges, it allows more and more current through, so the voltage drop across the inductor goes down, the voltage drop across the resistor goes up, until eventually there's no voltage drop across the inductor at all, all of it is on the resistor, and it's just like this isn't here again, it's just a wire. So you're getting 50 milliamps. At this point, the inductor is charged, and the current must still be flowing. It's only charged while the current is flowing. If you take this away, this is where you need your flyback diode on your motor or your transistors are going to explode, because without the current actively flowing, it's going to try and discharge, including through the open air, and spark your circuits and your open switches. So while the current is flowing at its maximum 50 milliamps with these numbers, this is charged to the equivalent of 50 milliamps. Now we can switch it. And we go over here to whatever this resistor is. We just hook it up like so, instantaneously switch it, and the inductor begins to discharge. What voltage? Not voltage, current, 50 milliamps. It's charged to 50 milliamps, and it's going to discharge in the same direction it was charged, the opposite of the capacitor. The capacitor gets charged this way and discharges out the same end. The inductor gets charged and then discharges the same direction of flow. They're opposites. So what voltage? Well, we can use Ohm's law. Voltage equals current times resistance. We have 50 milliamps. Let's say that this resistor is 1k ohms times 1k ohms. 50 divided by 1,000 times 1,000. I should have been able to do that in my head, but I didn't realize it until I typed it out. That's 50 volts. This inductor wants to put out 50 milliamps across 1 kilo ohm when it was initially charged with 100 ohms and 5 volts. It's the same amount of energy, but it doesn't care about the amount of energy. It cares about, essentially, the speed. I keep anthropomorphizing. You know what I mean. So it's going to put out 50 milliamps, and it's going to generate whatever voltage it needs to do that. 50 volts divided by a kilo ohm is 50 milliamps. So 50 volts goes across that resistor, and maybe that resistor explodes, maybe it doesn't. Mostly it depends on how long the energy is going across it. It'll generate a bunch of heat and then it'll fade away again. But that again, that is why you need your flyback diodes because the voltage is going to be whatever it needs to be to get that current across. If this were a 10 ohm resistor or even less, then the voltage would be lower than 5 volts. But that's how that works. This is why I say you can think about it as storing current instead of storing a magnetic field. A capacitor stores voltage and an inductor stores current. So what about this energy? Assuming no losses, once again in the perfect case, where we don't have resistances and heat dissipation and all that, we're just talking theoretically, hypothetically, ideally, about literally how much energy. Well, conservation of energy, it's neither created nor destroyed. If you have an inductor or a capacitor that have the same amount of energy in them, well, if it's the same amount of energy, we can set these equal to each other. So one half times L times I squared equals one half times capacitance times voltage squared, or we can just get rid of the halves. And so you can see, we charge a capacitor. Let's say we have the capacitor is 15 microfarads. Let's say the voltage is 5 volts. So 15 divided by a million times 5, and then let's multiply by 1,000, 1,000 again, and that is 75 microjoules in that capacitor. See, it's not much energy, is it? 75 microjoules with microfarads charged to 5 volts. So let's say we want to take an inductor, let's say a 1 Henry inductor, and give it the same amount of energy, exactly the same amount of energy, how much current is it going to try and put out if we then hook it up to something? Well, we can solve this equation. We divide over the inductance, so that's gone. We take the square root, and we just get current. So this is 1 Henry, and we already know this is 75 microjoules. So 75 microjoules divided by 1 Henry, and then take the square root, and we get roughly 8.66 milliamps. Hopefully I've done this math right. I'm going to feel a right fool if I haven't. But this is how you can convert between the same amount of energy. You can see what that energy is doing differently in each one. 75 microjoules in a 15 microfarad capacitor should generate 5 volts. And 
and a one Henry inductor should generate 8.66 milliamps, at least the instant they're connected and then they'll both go down because they're discharging. How much current the capacitor will generate is dependent upon the resistance. How much voltage the inductor will generate is dependent upon the resistance. Symmetry! I love symmetry! It's so wonderful. But this is the, the symmetry, the equivalence between capacitors and inductors. Now what's the point of this? That all seemed rather not useful, unless you're studying physics. It's because you can have inductors and capacitors in the same circuit. It's called an LC or RLC circuit. And it's incredibly big when making sine wave oscillators. There's something called an LC tank circuit. And you've got all kinds of things built upon it. And I will get into those in the future. For now, I'll be seeing you.